please welcome to the stage Chief Customer Officer Roger Scott. Hi, and welcome back. Um, great to have you all here today at Future Stack. Um, how about those announcements? What do you think about that? <laughs> to Lou, to Ken, to all the product GMs in the room, just a huge thank you uh, on behalf of all of our customers, actually, for the amazing technology that you've just delivered uh, to, uh, to the marketplace, to our customers. I think you're going to get my team being really busy over the next few months, so thank you for that. It's, uh, it's amazing. Um, I do also want to take this opportunity to thank all of you as customers that are in the room. Uh, your success is our success. Uh, however well you do as a res result of the solutions and the services that we provide to you reflects well on us. So we know how much you depend upon us, and we hope that you see just how much we're delivering to you in terms of capability and, and functionality and the world's first observability platform. Um, Interesting uh, story. During the break, I, w I took a, a break and was going to the restroom. There was a long queue there. I stood in the queue and uh, overheard a gentleman, two people behind me talking, going, wow, I didn't expect so many big announcements. They've got all the data. This is freaking awesome. <laughs> so hopefully you've just seen the amazing uh, value that we've delivered to you now and what you can take advantage of, which is fantastic. Um, but Back to customer focus, we know how important it is that we make you successful. So we're going to take a little bit of time and talk to one of our uh, long-standing customers. Um, and I'm going to invite Chris Dillon, the VP of Architecture for Cox Automotive, to join me on the stage. Chris. Hey, Chris. Right. Welcome. How are you doing? I am doing great. Awesome. How are you? Very well. Fantastic. Very well. Good. Um, so I, we, we've known each other for a fair amount of time. You yeah. sit on our customer advisory board as well, so thank you for that. Absolutely. Um, and we've worked very closely with you over the last couple of years. But to people in the audience maybe who don't know Cox Automotive as, as well as I do, uh, give them a little bit of background to the company and maybe also just elaborate a little bit about your role as VP of architecture. Sure, sure. So uh, Cox Automotive is um, uh, a collection of brands uh, that really you know, come together as one company. Uh, some of the brands that I guess folks in the audience might have heard of is uh, Auto Trader, Kelly Blue Book. Um, Auto Trader used to be the print magazine, now the website. Kelly Blue Book used to be a book, actually. Now it's a website, KBB. Uh, about 70% of car shoppers uh, go to those sites when they're in the market for a vehicle. Um, but those are really just the tip of the iceberg. And actually, if you go to the next slide, if you were a dealer, uh, an automotive dealer or a manufacturer, you would know about Cox Automotive for a whole different set of reasons. So um, uh, we provide B2B marketplaces where dealers can uh, exchange inventory uh, in an auction type of format. We provide logistic services, reconditioning services. Uh, we're also one of the biggest banks in the business, actually. So we underwrite uh, uh, the inventory on dealers' lots. Uh, they, they actually you know, finance those. Uh, just just like consumers do. Um, so a lot of different services, kind of an overarching mission of transforming the way that the world buys and sells and owns and uses cars uh, mm -hmm. kind of end to end. So that's, that's Cox Automotive uh, and sort of built, uh, we'll talk more about it I think, but, but put together over a series of years and acquisitions. Uh, my role uh, as uh, the leader of architecture, there's really kind of three parts of my team. So there's, uh, there's architecture, there's um, a cloud enablement type of team mm -hmm. uh, that really helps as we move uh, on a journey to the cloud. Uh, and then an innovation engineering team that really does kind of experiments and, and tinkers with new technology and how we could apply it in the automotive space. Right. OK. Yeah. Uh, so fascinating uh, company. It's had an amazing history of transformations. And I would hazard a guess that you're right in the middle of that. Your mission statement around uh, transforming the way the, the world buys, sells, and uses cars, yeah. which was interesting. Yeah. Tell us a little bit more about that. Sure, sure. Um, well, so, so one area that's kind of ripe for transformation is just like the actual transaction process. You know, so uh, folks who have been through the process of a vehicle transaction, you know, it's a it's a complicated one. Um, there's, there's the financing and figuring out, you know, how are we going to, are we going to loan? Are we going to lease? There's the trade in. Mm -hmm. uh, there's figuring out if you actually have the right to trade that vehicle in. So do you actually own it uh, is a question. There's, there's uh, compliance types of concerns. Um, 
uh, at the state and the federal level. So if you're trying to buy a car for me and I'm a dealer, mm -hmm. I can't sell it to you if you're a known you know, terrorist or on the watch list or that kind of right. thing. So uh, all of that stuff conspires together to make the in dealer experience really just kind of terrible. Like research shows, mm -hmm. people don't like to go to dealers to buy cars. So uh, one of the things we've been focused on is um, building a set of tools that allow dealers to buy and sell uh, vehicles online, just entirely online, negotiating the sale, getting a, a cash value for your trade-in, sight unseen, uh, structuring a deal, negotiating, and then all the way through the paperwork. And we really think that's part of the future. Of course, uh, there, are, there are companies like Tesla who are out there doing that you know, today, direct to consumer. Uh, we think the future is that all dealers will be doing more and more of that over time, and that, and that so will the manufacturers. Right. So that's one example. Let me give you one other uh, just kind of interesting right. example is um, uh, if folks have heard of like Porsche's Passport program, um, or Mercedes-Benz also has a thing called Mercedes-Benz Collection, these are examples of kind of vehicle as a service. So you pay a, a monthly fee and you get access to a whole fleet of vehicles that you can swap in and out of you know, throughout, the, uh, throughout the month. Uh, in, it, they're all insured. They're, you know, they, every time you get them, they have a full tank of gas and they're clean. Uh, and behind the scenes, that's all powered by our technology. So it's, it's a, a platform we have called Clutch. It's the consumer experience in an app that sort of says, all right, here, here's, here's a vehicle you might be interested in. Behind the scenes for the dealer, it's really like optimizing their fleet what vehicles should they have? When should they take them out of service? When do they need to be maintained? That sort of thing. Um, so those are a couple of examples. So uh, central to that, I mean, there's a huge amount of business transformation in that. In an industry, I, I hazard a guess, is very yeah. data and information rich. Yeah. Um, and you're responsible for driving that, uh, the technology transformation that drives the business transformation. Tell us a little bit about your journey in, yeah. in terms of technology transformation. Sure, yeah, so, so I mentioned, and you guys saw the slide um, with just a, a number of companies that we brought together. So over a period of about 10 years, a lot of acquisitions, uh, and in some cases, the companies we acquired were also doing acquisitions, right? So we, we came to a place a few years ago where uh, we had, uh, you know, from a technology perspective, a lot of diversity, right? 60 data centers, everything from AS400 to kind of cloud native, everything in between. Um, culturally, a lot of diversity, everything from like uh, uh, waterfall, you know, type of very predictable processes to kind of the lean startup, you know, uh, just, just get it out the door and then figure out what's next without kind of a plan. Um, so a lot of our transformation really started uh, around trying to bring all of that together and under a common sort of operating model and, and culture. Um, because as a bunch of different companies, it was really hard to collaborate. You know, there's just so much friction in the system. Um, so you know, for us, that was uh, bringing together um, scaled agile framework. So we actually implemented SAFE. Uh, across uh, 350 teams and 2,000 developers. So now we're all on a common cadence. Uh, we have roles and responsibilities that sound and look the same across the board. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, Amazon uh, Web Services. So we actually uh, looked at and then chose AWS as kind of our cloud provider. Uh, and, and it's really kind of the the platform that's starting to create commonality across mm -hmm. all of these different right. uh, you know, teams and, and products. Yeah. I did want to drill into a little bit of your experience of moving to the cloud, and mm -hmm. uh, Dave will be happy to, to hear this, but I know that you've said you're all in on AWS. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so talk to your, your uh, journey to the cloud, and in particular also just touch a little bit on how New Relics helped in that process as sure. well. Sure, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, um, so yeah, we are uh, all in on AWS. It's our, it's our cloud platform. For us, that means a couple things. Number one, if teams are building new software, um, they're building it on uh, the AWS platform with, with kind of a, a bias towards the managed services. You know, we're not trying to spin up EC2 and that sort of thing. We're trying to, to build on the platform and leverage it. Um, we're also doing targeted kind of migrations. So I mentioned we had 60 data centers. Uh, our goal is to have three. And so we're, we're rapidly kind of consolidating. We're down to about 26 right now. Um, and a big part of that is as we're, we're both consolidating and where it makes sense, we're moving workloads out into AWS, um, uh, which has been important. You know, the, the other thing that we think about with AWS is um, it provides kind of an on-ramp 
for teams mm -hmm. where um, we can, you know, we can almost put like a toll gate, and I mean that in like a really positive sense, um, as a, a place to sort of look at how we upskill and uptool, if that's a word, the teams, right? Mm -hmm. So we talk about, all right, a, a team is going to start operating on AWS. Step one is they come to the cloud enablement team, and the cloud enablement team has a whole set of tools and training and so forth available. Uh, one of which is New Relic, right? So we have a, a common tool chain that we uh, constructed to be kind of like, here's the next generation of tools that we want our teams to be using. Um, and our enablement team really builds like all the scaffolding around that to make sure that it's gonna work really nicely together. Um, I was talking to the director of that team recently and he said, you know, if we can't get uh, a tool like, uh, you know, a new tool like New Relic up and running for a developer in their environment in less than an hour, we haven't done our job yet. You know, we've right. got to build all of the things that make it really easy to adopt. Um, and that just sort of creates, again, a new set of, like, a new consistency for our teams, but also, um, uh, you know, is, is a way that we can improve their skills as we go. Right. And, and their tooling. And I, I guess, um I mean, that's, it's an opportunity, as you say, to rethink um, you know, some of the tooling you use and some of the architectures you're using. Um, a part of it is also you want to move faster. Yeah. Uh, you want to be able to respond to the business quicker. Um, and I guess a big part of that is experimentation. Um, so talk a little bit about that, how you've, you've been able to move quicker, respond to market dynamics, or, or sure. put things out of the market and respond to the, you know, the consumer's reaction right. to that. Yeah, I mean, there are so many ways that uh, operating in AWS, you know, on a modern stack, you know, lets you move faster. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of experimentation, I'll give a quick example. So, and maybe one that folks can relate to. Again, AutoTrader, a brand that, that uh, uh, shoppers go to a lot if they're in the market for a vehicle. About six years ago, um, AutoTrader was in a strategic situation where lots of new competitors were entering the market. And, and before that, it was sort of the only game in town. Um, business was great, but some disruptors came along. And so um, we studied the situation and said, you know, what we really need is an ability to uh, just do some really dramatic experiments that would be business model impacting. It would change our metrics and how we represent the value to the dealers. And we need to do that in a controlled way. Um, and what it really meant to do it right was to have an entirely separate stack of the auto trader experience, like an entirely uh, fully built site uh, that we could send some traffic to and watch how it worked uh, and so forth. And it was much more than just kind of a feature flag, you know, around an existing code base. Um, and so we did it. We spun it all up in AWS and it didn't take, you know, much time to get it up and running. We called it the innovation site. But it's the kind of thing that we could never have done in an on-premise world. Yeah. Right. Uh, and uh, it, it, well, we could have sort of played around with it, but it just would never have given us the kind of results and the isolation that we needed. Yeah. Um, so that was a great example. And, you know, we've, we've used that kind of pattern uh, elsewhere as well. Um, we've run a lot of Kubernetes uh, in, in one of our divisions and being able to spin up a new stack or, or a new cluster and deploy and upgrade and test it all out, you know, darkly and then slowly move traffic and then tear down the old, just, just to, I mean, it changes changes the game completely. Yeah. I mean, that's uh, dramatic from a company that started out with a print catalog and had a very large uh, bricks and mortar dealer network. Um, so I, I would imagine associated with some of that sort of change to the technology is also a massive cultural transformation. Mm. And um, maybe as part of you know, commenting on that, just talk to the accountability that you've been able to bring uh, as, as part of your move to the cloud and adopting AWS and New Relic, and maybe the role that New Relic played in that as sure. well. Sure, yeah, yeah. Yeah, for sure. So um, I, I mentioned the idea of you know, step one for us in, in driving that cultural transformation was just getting to a common kind of operating model, common set of titles so that when you, you know, if you were in Burlington, Vermont, you pick up the phone and call someone in Dallas, Texas on another team, you know, you knew who you were talking to, right? Uh, it's hard to, to hold people accountable to, you know, outcomes if it isn't clear what role would be accountable for such a thing. And right. there's a lot of diversity there. Um, once we got there, you know, tools like uh, New Relic, you, you, can't, you can't hold someone accountable for what you can't measure. Mm -hmm. And so... Um, as we've put New Relic in people's hands, uh, we've been able to really hold teams accountable to a, you know, a, a you build it, you own it type of, um, type of model. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we can, um, 
you know, you can, you can go around to team rooms uh, in Atlanta or Irvine or um, uh, you know, Dallas and see New Relic up on screens. Um, uh, it, sometimes it's in a development type of cycle, so they're deploying and then watching in their you know, test suite, all right, how did that impact my metrics you know, uh, within New Relic? Um, oftentimes it's just watching production. Mm -hmm. and, you know, we've got New Relic, most of the time, uh, the alerts that fire out of New Relic, there will be a threshold where they're starting to go to our knock, uh, you know, so that so we can manage like a bigger incident. But by the time it gets there, the teams have already been watching and, you know, there are, there are lower level alerts that they're watching and, and uh, oftentimes, you know, well out in front of our kind of, you know, big operation center yeah. uh, with issues that are, that are developing and so forth. So, um, so that's been one way that we've, we've used it to drive kind of a new sense of accountability for ownership. Um, another way that I think is interesting, and, uh, and again, it, it dovetails a little bit into our AWS relationship. So we use um, uh, the well-architected framework. AWS has this well-architected, it's five pillars. Uh, I wrote them down because I knew, I always forget one of them, but they're security, reliability, operational excellence, cost optimization, and performance efficiency. Okay, so a bunch of non-functionals. Um, and and the, the framework has a bunch of question and answer and you can kind of assess. But what we did is we turned that into a process for our teams where every team on a quarterly basis actually assesses their platform and says, okay, how am I doing against each of these pillars? And we have some direction that kind of lets folks say, all right, am I red, yellow, or green on each of these? And then what's my roadmap to, to more health, right? Um, and what we're able to do is not just think about it in terms of the questions and answers that AWS provides, but also the metrics that come out of New Relic, right? right? So three out of the five of those, uh, you guys um, are sort of a key data point for. Right. So you can answer all the Q&A and sort of say, are you following the best practice? But what does the data tell you? And we really use that as kind of a, a triangulation point, yeah. um, which is really, really powerful for us. Uh, and it helps us link that data to, um, to topics that the business cares about. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting that it's an architectural framework, but if you think about those five pillars, they're all things that actually executives should care about. And so when we build these heat maps, we put them in front of executives and say, security, you see how security has some yellow in it? Well, that's, we need to invest there. That's a business problem for you. Uh, we have a, a thing that we say that there are no, uh, no technology projects. There are only business projects. And so it's, it's helped us turn the corner and, and take a lot of those kind of things that are the execs traditionally might think of as kind of yucky technical stuff mm -hmm. and turn them Creating into business relevant. things, yeah. right? Yeah, make them relevant to them. And, uh, and, and tools like New Relic really help support the case there because we can say, do you know how many uh, performances, do you know how many customers we impacted because of this area that we need to invest in? Yeah. Um, so it's been really helpful there. I think that, I mean, that was a big discussion. We had our customer advisory board meeting yesterday and I know that was quite a, a lengthy discussion around being able to tie back to business impact. So mm -hmm. it sounds like you guys have done really well on that. And I, it probably creates more relevance. Um, and I love the fact that you're driving accountability because there's a common set of data yeah. you know, that you're looking at, not being subjective about your assessment of the state of the business or the state of the technology. A um, Couple more questions. Yeah, One, sure. uh, a bunch of people in the audience, I'm sure, in a similar situation to you in the middle of a major transformation, uh, 60 data centers down to three. And yeah trying to drive a different culture and, sure. and behavioral pattern. Yeah. Any, what, what sort of guidance, advice would you offer to people in the room in the midst of that? Yeah, um, I think the first thing I would say is, uh, you know, transformation is, is definitely a journey, mm -hmm. right? Um, uh, and, and there are gonna be intermediate stops along the way. Uh, I, I like to do road trips. And when I do, I like to figure out where I'm going to, where my hotel will be, you know, sort of at each place. And maybe there's some variation as I get there. Um, so think about kind of what the, the steps are that you're gonna take. And I mentioned for us, number one was absolutely, you've gotta have a common like operating model that creates a taxonomy where people can, you know, can have good conversations, especially at a big enterprise. Um, so think about that uh, would be one. Um, and then, the second thought I have is uh, around just kind of 
you're, right, you're on the journey, so what are, who are your travel partners? Um, that could be an internal question, meaning do you have the right team to pull off what you're trying to do, and, and are they all in for it? Um, for us, it was also, um, it really was about, okay, who are the, who are the partners we're going to have externally that are going to pull us forward, you know, um, that we're not going to be learning alongside of necessarily, but that are out ahead of us and are going to say, hey, this is the way to do these things. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, AWS was a part of that. New Relic was a part of that. Um, uh, PagerDuty has been a part of that. Like they've, you know, their, their model of doing incident response and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, but think about that. Think about who you can partner with that will really help you to upskill and improve the way that your teams work. Yeah. I love that, that it's a journey. I mean, the destination is important, but there are multiple waypoints along the way in that journey, and uh, you want moments of value, and you're going to face moments of truth. So yeah, being sure. able to go with the right partners is, yeah. is critical. Um, I wanted to close, uh, just to tie back a little bit to some of the announcements that Lou gave in his keynote, and also back to some of the discussion of the Customer Advisory Board. Yeah. I know uh, you've been one of the um, early adopters of programmability with us. Mm. Uh, maybe comment on your experiences of that. I know you've had a couple of your team build uh, yeah. node packs with us. Sure. Um, what do you see as the potential? What, do you, what did you focus on initially, and what has been the feedback from your team? Yeah, absolutely. So um, uh, first of all, it is, it, you're, I mean, it's exactly what we need in the sense of uh, the ability to, we've got a lot of diversity. So we need to be able to kind of tailor what the, you know, the solution to a specific context. Mm -hmm. So um, it's, it's part of my challenge all the time is figuring out when you are kind of laying down a guardrail, how wide is that guardrail? So, uh, and, and there's a worry that, well, this tool like New Relic may not be exactly what you know, a team over here needs and how do you make sure that that team has some autonomy you know, to pick the tool set that, uh, that they need. So, being able to, you know, turn over the controls a little bit to the teams and have them build and innovate within the platform mitigates some of that risk, right, for us. So that's one thing. The other thing I'll just say is, uh, yeah, one of our guys went to uh, the, you know, nerd hack that I think Lou talked about earlier uh, and was stoked to do so and, and you know, spent uh, whatever, 17 hours a day coding, and, and, uh, and he actually built something that was um, you know, relevant to us, which is we use uh, LaunchDarkly um, for our, uh, our dealer website platforms, mm -hmm. and, uh, and so he built a tool that would allow us to you know, integrate really deeply into, into LaunchDarkly, um, flip on features, see how they're behaving, uh, captured you know, uh, instrumentation a little bit differently, and so forth. Um, so he came back super jazzed. He's, uh, he's going to do a, a training uh, you know, session internally just to talk about, hey, here's what I built. Here's how it's going to work. Here's how other folks can use it. Um, and we're just, we love the partnership because of that, because of you know, the, the level at which we're able to collaborate with you guys and then sort of champion that internally. So it's been fantastic. Excellent. That's, yeah. that's exciting. And uh, we, we look forward to continuing the journey and partnering with you as you continue your transformation. Yeah. Uh, Thanks, Chris. Yeah, Thank absolutely. You very much. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Yeah.